Hi, my name is Jesse Anderson, and today I'm going to explain how Kafka works with Legos. To start off with, Kafka is a distributed publish subscribe system with some interesting features that are really focused on big data. To start off with, Kafka is a publish subscribe system. That means that it's going to have data that's published into it and consumed by other machines. So here I have several pieces of paper in front of me. These red pieces of paper represent a publisher. These blue pieces of paper represent the Kafka cluster. In this case, there are several different machines within that cluster. The green and yellow pieces of paper represent consumers. So what we can do is a, have a piece of data actually come from a producer and being produced into the Kafka cluster. Now out of that, this data is going to be then published out to one of the consumers and one of the other consumers. Both of these consumers are going to need this piece of data and they're going to be subscribed in and pull that data and bring that data in. From whatever they do with that after that, maybe they'll process it in some fashion, maybe they'll do something with it. A lot of times they'll process that data and actually send it back into the Kafka cluster again. So all of this data, as this data is moved around, it's actually published on topics. So here we'd have a, a topic. So this topic is saying, here's a piece of data. Here's a type of data that I want to send out. And we're going to send this out on topics. As we work with these two publishers, these two publishers can send data on the same topic. And that way, consumers in turn are going to be able to access that data. This data for topics, it's going to be divided up into however we want. And one of the ways that it's automatically divided up is using what's called partitioning. And partitioning is a way that Kafka breaks up data. And remember how we talked about how this is for big data? Well, we're going to have to break this up, and this is a common way of breaking up data in big, in big data, where we're going to break this up based on the key. And all of this data, as it moves through our Kafka system, it's sent with keys and values. So when we partition this out, what we might have is data as it's being sent by the, by the producers. We might have several different pieces of data all on the same topic. So let's take an example. Here we have two pieces of data. We have a dark colored piece of data and we have a green piece of data. Well, what we do is we partition these out so that this, when this black this black piece of data gets published into the cluster, it's one of these consumer, excuse me, one of these brokers within our Kafka cluster is going to be responsible for that. So the data gets sent out. Here at the producer side, it's going to decide which one of these brokers is responsible for serving that data. And this is once again, it's done behind the scenes for you using the API, but this is mostly for your edification. So here we have this black piece of data. This black piece of data is going to be sent into our cluster and one of these machines is going to be responsible for it. So let's assume, let's just say that this machine is responsible for that piece of data. From there, we're going to have these particular machines consume that data. So as you can see, I have one piece of data, these two pieces of data, they've been consumed by the yellow consumer. However, I have this group of data right here. I have these two consumers with the same color. What this is called is it's called a consumer group. And this allows you to scale in a very interesting way. So instead of having a single machine doing all your consumption of all the data, when you have big data concerns, you can't just have one machine consume all of that data. It's eventually going to have problems. It's not going to be able to keep up. So what we ideally want to do is have a group of machines that are uh, working together in order to work with that data. So what we have here is this particular consumer is responsible for the dark color uh, partition. This consumer is responsible for the green partition. So let's, let's follow that through and actually see how this would flow through once more. So here we have light green coming out of this consumer, excuse me, this producer. It's going to go into our Kafka cluster. And here it, we've decided that it's green. So this, this broker is responsible for that. And as it's coming through, this consumer is responsible for processing that data. And here, this one, this consumer, is responsible for processing all that data. 
So let's take another example. Let's say that uh, as part of the dark colors, we're, we're dealing with all shades of black, so gray and that sort of thing. So here, we'll take another piece of data. It's going to be produced into our cluster. So here, this broker is responsible for that piece of data. Then we're going to give that to the rest of the cluster. So here we have, we're showing how things are flowing through. One of the things, one of the interesting things that I'll point out is um, we'll take another piece of data. So here on our producer side, data is pushed into the Kafka cluster. So here, data is pushed in from our producer, and that data is, resides right here. However, when the consumers actually go to work with that data, instead of it being pushed to those consumers, what actually happens is that the consumers reach out to the Kafka cluster and say, do you have any more data for me? So that helps with the overload. If there's ever an overload or way too much data happening, that will help your cluster deal with the uh, ebbs and flows of, or however, if a significant amount of data starts coming in, these consumers won't be overloaded. They'll simply fall a little bit behind. So what's interesting about Kafka itself is how it handles the data. So when we were talking about falling behind, it's not actually going to lose any data. All of that data is actually being uh, queued up as we're gonna talk about in a moment. What will happen is it will just eventually catch up over the time as these two machines start processing and this machine processes all that data. It's going to get back to what's real time. So let's actually go through the, uh, I'm just going to fast forward a little bit and put some more data in here so we can show another concept. So. We produce some data, and that data go, goes into our cluster, into our consumers. And here, let's say for the for the sake of argument, blue, it's also part of part of the greens. And pink. Let's say that's part of the the this whole light colored topic as well. And we'll do one more green, like like green. Here it is responsible. Here it is responsible for this one. And here it is responsible for this one. So if you've been very sharp-eyed as, as you've watched me do this, you've actually noticed that as any each piece of data comes in, I've been stacking it like this. So what's interesting about this is we can actually go through and let's say that this that this machine had went down somewhere somewhere along the way. What we'd know is it would know I I last left off at this point. This point was right here and right here, let's say. What will happen is as the data comes back through, it's going to wake up again and it's going to be able to say, give me all the data that happened since I last asked for it. So this, this will, uh, the Kafka cluster will say, okay, here is the last, what's called the offset. Here's the last offset for this partition, the last offset for this partition. We're going to give you everything since then. So as you can see, all of that data will still flow in the same exact fashion. So it's putting them side by side. Here, here's all the data that happened since you last left off. And that's interesting because when we deal with distributed systems, we need to actually deal with failure. So in this case, let's say that this machine failed or died. What we don't want to do is we don't want to have all the data that was being passed through just be lost. This machine ideally, or this system, ideally needs to be able to process all the data that was missed. So this commit log that we have right here and right here is what's going to help us say, here is all the data that, that's happened since you failed. Another way that this is used is, let's say that this consumer wasn't a real-time consumer, let's say it's what's called a batch consumer. So a batch consumer, instead of consuming at all times, it just says every so often it wakes up and says, give me all the data that you've received since the last time I checked in. So what will happen is it will contact these two producers, excuse me, these two brokers, and it's going to pull that data in and that data is going to be given in larger chunks. Then that producer, excuse me, that consumer can actually go through and say, uh, maybe that gets put in HDFS, maybe that gets put into some other system of record. 
Another interesting part of Kafka is it fills in a really good interesting gap for big data where uh, oftentimes when you're dealing with Hadoop you have issues with small files. Well Kafka helps solve that issue with small files. Here you're able to deal with that and get one big file. But Kafka isn't your long-term storage system like HDFS or maybe S3 are. It's a more of a near-term storage system. So this data that we have right here, there's a couple ways we can work with that. So one, one way is what's called a retention policy. One way is to just lop it off and say, I want to store this much data. And as it nears that, that amount of data, it's just going to lop it off and say, okay, here's the data we have left, we've deleted the rest. And now this machine has more, more hard drive space in order to store that data. Another retention policy is to do what's called a key-based. So as you see, I've created this, this commit log, and we know everything as it's happened in by time order. But looking at this, we can actually visually see there are certain places where data has come in, and we could actually lop that data off and still maintain that key. So once again, here's our key. Our key is the color of the, of the brick. What we could do is we could say, okay, we have a, a newer dark green. We're going to take that away. And we have a newer light green. We're going to take that away. So what we've done is we've reduced the amount of data that we're storing. However, we haven't actually lost the latest version of that data. So now we'll have a little bit more storage there. So I'd like to thank you for watching this video, and I hope it was very informative and, help, and helps you learn a little bit more about Kafka.